Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar about citizens' rights after Brexit. My name is Per Johansson. I'm the head of office of the European Parliament office in Edinburgh. Yes, we still have the European Parliament office in Edinburgh, and uh, we are still working. Of course, uh, at the moment, it's not business as usual, because uh, in, as usual would mean that we would all meet together in one room, have a good discussion, uh, let the questions flow back and forth, but unfortunately we cannot do that, um, because these are unusual times. We are in very intense times when it comes to the negotiations between the UK and the EU about the future relationship. We are in the midst of a global pandemic. And this means that we all have to find new ways of working and living our lives. Normally, I would also, in this situation, give a bit of a health and safety briefing. Uh, today, I will say a few words. I will say something about health, which is that thank you to all the frontline staff and essential workers that have been working so hard for all of us to keep all of us safe in these strange and difficult times. And of course, in the UK, a lot of these frontline workers are EU citizens. So thank you on behalf of the whole of the European Parliament and especially the European Parliament Liaison Office in Edinburgh. Thank you for all that you do. And the safety message from me will be stay safe. Keep sticking to the guidelines, keep doing what you're doing, because it seems to be working. So thank you very much all of you for doing that. I would also like to say thank you to our panelists and our moderator today. So Terje Reinke, Ben McPherson and Kirsty Hughes for coming on today and for making this hopefully into a very interesting event. Um, I would also like to say thank you to my team, Julia, Helen, and uh, Louise, who have also have been helping me behind the scenes to make this work. If you would like to share um, any thoughts on this or this event on, on social media, then please use the hashtag EP on Brexit. The other thing I would like to say that this today is not the forum um, where we can give personal legal advice. If you would like that, then you will have to unfortunately ask others, like for example, the Citizens Advice Bureau in Scotland or uh, the Citizens Rights Project. There are other forums for that. Um, and with all that, I would just extend my warm welcome to all of you, both on the Zoom and on Facebook Live. And I will hand you over to Kirsty Hughes, our moderator. Thank you very much, Per. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. Um, it's great to be here and, and I'm very pleased that Per invited me to moderate this session. I'm really looking forward to hearing both of our speakers and to involving the audience with the questions and answers. And we have up to almost 90 minutes for this. So, so hopefully we, we can get a lot of questions and discussion in. I've been asked, um, I'm going to introduce our two speakers, but I've also been asked to make some opening remarks about where we are with Brexit. So, so what I'm going to do is briefly tell you who our speakers are, make a few remarks about Brexit, and then go to our speakers for their formal presentation. Um, each of them are going to take 10 or 15 minutes, and then we will be open for questions. And I'll, I'll repeat this at the end of the as uh, their opening remarks, but we would ask you to use the question and answer function on Zoom to, to put your questions forward. Um, and also, if you're making comments on Facebook then, and questions there, we, we will do our best to see if we can pick up pertinent questions from that as well. So, so as I say, welcome, delighted to, delighted to be here also in Edinburgh this afternoon. Um, let me introduce Terry Reinke. Terry Reinke has been a member of the European Parliament since 2014. She's vice president of vice president for singular, not plural, of the Greens EFA group in the European Parliament. 
And Terry is also a founding member of the EU Friends of Scotland group, as well as being co-chair of the EU-UK Friendship Group in the European Parliament. She's lived in the UK and she's, I gather, studied at Edinburgh University. Um, politically, she's extremely active and, can I say, impressive. And some of her main interests include campaigning for women's rights for LGBTI people, against exploitation of European workers and for strengthening Europe's regions. And that, that's only some, some of her main areas and priorities. Um, very much glad to welcome as well Ben McPherson, known to many of you, I'm sure. Ben is a member of the Scottish Parliament. He represents Edinburgh North and Leith. He's the Minister for Public Finance and Migration in the Scottish Government. And in that role, he has responsibility for EU citizens' rights in Scotland. He was previously Minister for Europe, Migration and International Development. I got to know him in that role. Um, he is as well a qualified solicitor and he's worked in a variety of roles before he became an MSP, including in charitable, environmental and financial jobs. So I'm delighted to have both of us both, both of them with us today. And as I say, in a couple of minutes, I will pass the floor to them. Um, but first I'm going to make just, just a, a few remarks about where we are with, with Brexit. And, and forgive me if I'm stating the, the obvious in, in some or most of, of what I say, but I will, I will endeavor to be brief. Um, I, think, I think with because of the COVID crisis uh, so dominated our, our lives for the last couple of months that, that Brexit inevitably took a back seat. And yet, when we think it's just a few short months ago, the 31st of January of this year, that the UK actually finally left the European Union. And we are in transition, as you know, we're in a transition at the moment to the end of 2020. So we're still in the customs union, we're still in the EU's single market. Um, but actually, we are not in the European Union. If we suddenly had a huge change of minds, we would have to apply to rejoin. Um, the UK government, of course, could ask to extend the transition period. The Scottish government has said it should do that. Um, but the UK government has said it won't do that. So, so I think this may be something that will also come up in the, the discussion, um, what would the implications be if, if transition was by any chance extended? It's possible we would have to ask, or the government would have to ask by the end of June, and it could be extended for up to two years. At the moment, I think if you've been noticing this at all in the, in the media, the talks are clearly not going very well. The fourth round of talks finished last week. Um, the EU's nego chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, essentially underlined the fact that the government, the UK government in his view is not negotiating on the basis of the political declaration that both sides, the EU and UK signed last year. And you get a feeling of lack of trust and a certain, can I say, exasperation even on the EU side. I remember talking to a, a senior trade official in, in Brussels at the, at the start of, of this process in early 2017, and, and that person said to me, if you don't have trust and you aren't trying to secure a deal that is in both sides mutual interest, you're really not going to get very far. We know there are specific areas that are particularly causing difficulty. One is the so-called level playing field conditions. How do we make sure that both sides stick to current and future levels of, of progressive regulation on social issues, environmental issues, on human rights issues, on, on climate change, and also on the tricky area, but vital area of state aid. There's the whole area very pertinent in Scotland of fisheries. And, and there's a perhaps technical, but actually democratically very important issue. Of how do you arrange governance or oversight of an agreement once you've got it? Um, at the moment, all of these look very sticky. I think it's quite likely we will need some form of political intervention, um, and that may come in the coming weeks and, and months. It was, it was said that Boris Johnson might be talking to the Commission president in, in this week or next, but that certainly doesn't seem to have happened yet. I think the other thing we can say about, about the deal, and again, the deal that's 
attempted to being negotiate, negotiated, and we'll hear from our speakers on this, I'm sure, is that at the moment it looks like a very limited deal. Um, partly because of the UK's demands, the UK's insistence that it wants to leave the single market and it wants to leave the customs union. At the same time, there is a certain amount of attempted cherry picking going on on the UK side. It doesn't want a level playing field. It does want access for services. Where does this take us then? I think it takes us towards, once again, a possibility of a no deal. We seem to have spent a lot of the last couple of years in a groundhog day of going around and discussing no deal, yeah, or it takes us to a more limited, um, basic free trade agreement. Now, this is not the same no deal as we were discussing a couple of years ago, because of course we've got the withdrawal agreement that enshrines EU citizens' rights, as we're going to discuss more today. It sets out an agreed financial contribution from the UK to cover its obligations, and it sets up the special protocol for Northern Ireland. Having said that, even in the absence of the economic crisis we're now hitting because of the COVID-19 crisis, leaving the EU without a deal would be politically damaging, I think, but also very economically damaging to our trade, to our growth, to our productivity, and to our jobs. If you add that to the economic damage from the corona crisis, then you're getting a, a double whammy. And you're not only getting a double whammy of economic damage, what you're also getting a double helping of is uncertainty. I think at this rate, if we do get to a, a basic deal by October, that's going to be very little time for businesses, for citizens, for NGOs, for all sorts of organizations to get ready for whatever that new deal means, instead of being part of the EU single market and customs union. So I think there's uncertainty of how we're going to adjust to COVID-19 and, and the economics of that. There's uncertainty on Brexit. The most obvious intelligent thing to do, in my opinion, uh, would be to extend transition. But we were told again this, this week by, by Minister in, in the UK government, Penny Mordaunt, that the government will not ask for that. So I think we have to take that position of the Conservative government seriously and, and plan for either a very basic trade deal with not much time to adjust to it or even to the possibility of no deal. So I will leave my comments there. I, I hope that's helpful by way of, by way of overview and background to, to our more specific focus today on EU citizens' rights. And I will now step purely into the role of moderator and I shall invite Terry Ranker to speak first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Um, I am unfortunately, uh, uh, I don't have a super stable internet connection, so I hope that you can see and hear me well. If there is any problem, um, maybe you can just uh, let me know. And um, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation and organizing this very important event. Um, as Kirsty has already uh, highlighted this, is for me also a, a very personal discussion because uh, I myself lived in Edinburgh. I uh, did my Erasmus year at the University of Edinburgh, which was uh, one of the best years of my life for sure. Um, and that was 10 years ago. And I remember that when I left back then um, that I always told myself, um, this might be a goodbye, but it's not forever. And obviously, um, with the situation and with Brexit, um, the possibilities that I would ever you know, have the chance to come back um, and live in Edinburgh and Scotland again um, uh, have not uh, increased. And um, so this is why for me, this is also something that, you know, affects me personally very much. And also because I still believe um, that Brexit um, was not uh, a good step, neither for the UK nor for the rest of the European Union. But here we are now uh, in this situation. Um, and uh, we know that especially among citizens, uh, EU citizens in the UK, but also UK citizens in the EU, there have been a lot of concerns about how this might affect their lives. Uh, and I think because of these concerns, um, um, it's very important to have exactly discussions like this um, and to see how we can make sure um, that these concerns are heard and that we can actually put them into into action in our um, political um, uh, steps that we are taking. 
Um, and I must say that these concerns to me, um, they are not ungrounded because we have seen in the Brexit referendum um, a very divisive language, um, a very alienating language uh, towards EU citizens in the UK. And um, the government still now, the UK government is giving very uh, mixed messages um, towards um, EU citizens uh, living in the UK. Um, and this is why a lot of people still feel scared about what their future might, might look like. Um, data suggests that uh, a lot of people, uh, EU citizens uh, in the UK, still don't trust really um, that even the safeguards that are in the withdrawal agreement are going to be kept. Um, I found it very interesting. We had a debate uh, in, with colleagues from the European Parliament recently that um, these numbers are very high um, amongst EU citizens, uh, but there is a much lower concern amongst EU citizens uh, living in Scotland because they feel much more represented um, by the Scottish Parliament and the debate in Scotland. And I, I hope that this is also something um, that some of you might share. Obviously, in the European Parliament, uh, we are going to stay uh, the Parliament of EU citizens uh, living in the UK as well. Um, and this is why we are very much concerned with uh, what is happening right now. Um, Kirsty has already given some insight into uh, the discussions with the negotiations that are ongoing. I don't want to comment on everything. I just want to very briefly say next week we are going to adopt a report in the European Parliament on the negotiations, uh, on the mandate, on the situation that we have in the negotiations at the moment. Um, and uh, as was said, there are still a lot of controversial issues. Um, I don't believe um, that they can basically be clarified uh, in the very slim uh, timescale that we still have. Um, so in the parliament, well, there is the hope still, I would say, but it's diminishing um, that there might be an extension uh, of the negotiation period. Um, obviously, we would like to have a comprehensive agreement um, with regards to level playing fields, with regards to contentious areas like, for example, fisheries, uh, data protection. Um, we feel that many of the things that are in the mandate and that are being discussed in the European Parliament had actually already been uh, agreed on, at least in the political declaration, and now the UK government seems to be backsliding on this, which is very worrying. Um, but obviously, especially the topic of citizens' rights is very much of our concern and will also really be at the core of the report that we are adopting next week in the European Parliament. And there are two main aspects that I wanted to highlight very briefly. And the first one is indeed about the implementation of citizens' rights that uh, are safeguarded in the withdrawal agreement. Um, we still hear um, concerns about um, discrimination. One of the things um, that has raised um, a lot of uh, concerns about this is that there is no physical document for pre-settled and settled status for EU citizens in the UK. This comes up over and over again that um, this uh, is worrying people, that um, the UK government has not uh, made this possible. Obviously, also a lot of questions about UK citizens in the rest of the European Union have not been properly addressed. This is also something that we are giving back to the EU27. And the second point that we want to highlight um, uh, next to this um, answering to these concerns is very much the active involvement of citizens, citizens' organizations uh, in the process um, of the um, supervision of the withdrawal agreement, because um, one of the things that um, can be done in order to meet these concerns is indeed to create transparency and to create involvement for citizens themselves um, and uh, make their voices heard in the procedure um, uh, supervising um, the implementation of the withdrawal agreement. The, separate, the second aspect um, is obviously the, the question of the future relations. Um, we had already highlighted in a resolution that was passed in January um, what the European Parliament demands there. Um, one of the things that is very important for us is always to have full reciprocity. Um, obviously, we would like to have uh, legally binding provisions that would still make it possible also in the future um, for people to move between the UK and the European Union. Now, the UK government has said that this is not um, within their interest. Um, this is something that uh, I can only say I very much uh, regret. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that we want to push for is that at least certain groups, like for example, students, apprentices, uh, researchers will still be possible um, to live in the UK respectively in the European Union and to move uh, work together and uh, have exchanges. Um, 
not the least because I had experiences myself um, to keep the, Euro uh, the United Kingdom in the Erasmus program, in other programs like, for example, the European Volu uh, Voluntary Service, um, because I believe uh, we are in this very difficult situation right now. And uh, one of the things that I'm very much afraid of is that um, there will be a push um, to turn our backs towards each other. I think that would be exactly the, the wrong way of dealing with this situation. The UK and the European Union are going to stay very, very close uh, neighbors and allies. Uh, and this is why making exchange possible, making it possible for people to live in the UK, respectively in the European Union, is one of the things that we are really fighting for. And I would like to close with um, talking a little bit about the initiative that Kirsty had also already mentioned, um, the friendship group in the European Parliament. Um, it was initiated basically one day after the uh, outcome of the UK elections uh, last year in December, where it was clear that Brexit was going to happen. Uh, and we are a group of MEPs across the political spectrum, across the European Union. We now have members from uh, all democratic political groups and almost all member states in the European Union. And we want to fight for continued close ties with the UK and to work with uh, the very big pro-European um, movement in the UK, citizens' organizations, obviously. Um, and we want to continue to stay an entry point for um, these people in the European Parliament, um, because this story of Brexit uh, and the discussion between the European Union and the United Kingdom, it is not over, even though some people might make, um, make, uh, want to make you believe that. And this is why I believe it has become even more important to work on that, to create a platform, to have exchanges. Um, and this is what we will continue to do. Um, and I'm really happy that um, also um, there is a specific friendship group that is working on uh, the relations with Scotland. Um, we are seeing our work as being complementary. Um, we are very closely working with each other. Um, and I hope that this can be one of the um, um, also for the future, one of the exchange points where we keep very, uh, to keep very close relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Terry. That, that was great to hear from you and especially to hear you conclude on, on such a, a positive note. It's certainly one of the things that I've tended to emphasize at, at some of the talks I've been at on Brexit in the last year or two, um, and especially in the, in the last six months that we, we may have left the European Union, sadly, from my point of view, but we're still European. Scotland is still a European country. Uh, the UK is a European state, and we have to decide what we're going to do and how we're going to communicate with each other as, as fellow Europeans. So with no more ado, I would now invite Ben McPherson to, to take the floor, if that's not a too old fashioned term for a, for a webinar. Ben, over to you. Thank you very much, Kirsty, and a very good afternoon to everyone. I'm really delighted to be part of this event today and, and glad that so many are, are listening and to also uh, have this opportunity to, to have dialogue uh, with yourself, Kirsty, and thanks for, for all that you continue to do. Uh, thanks to Per and your team at the European Parliament office here in Edinburgh and all that you've done to organise today's event and continuing to, to support a variety of stakeholders, including the Scottish Government, on matters to do with Brexit and, and our ongoing connections to Europe. And also thank you to Terry for joining us. Um, last time we spoke, I was in Brussels for the the, the days leading up to and including uh, the day of Brexit, very sadly. And we met when the establishment of the group that you talked about, uh, the Friends of Scotland group, uh, was taking place and, and recognised. And it's uh, remarkable to reflect on that time and how much has happened because of the coronavirus and how much that's affected all of us. But also to consider how the issues remain the same. And one of the most important issues in that is, of course, how we continue together and the Scottish Government playing a key role in that to support EU citizens here in Scotland. Not so long after that event, I was reshuffled in the government and uh, moved from the external affairs team into the finance team, uh, but was very glad to, to keep responsibility for migration because it's such an important area for the, the, the human aspect to it and the, 
the, the, the, the fact that being pro-migration and supportive of migrants who, who do us the compliment of, of coming to live in Scotland is, is crucial to, to our values in the Scotland that we want to create. Uh, but also because uh, the work uh, that we still have to do is, is still substantial and important. And I would like to just touch on that briefly in my remarks today. So that responsibility that I have uh, and that the whole of the Scottish Government shares to, to make EU citizens uh, and other migrants, but in, in this instance, we're talking uh, about EU citizens. And of course, when I say EU citizens, I mean the EAA and also Switzerland as well, to make sure those, uh, all those citizens who are being affected by the Brexit scenario uh, feel welcome and valued. And also that their contributions, their wide ranging contributions uh, to our country, to our shared culture, to the provision of public services, our economy, and generally and importantly, the enrichment of our society uh, to our communities as friends, family, neighbours, colleagues, uh, is, is remarkable and uh, extremely valued by the Scottish Government and I would uh, strongly maintain by, by Scotland as a whole, as a populace. And we really have an important job to do here in, we have done for the number of years since the, the, the vote in 2016, but particularly in this period, to continue to emphasize that really strong welcoming message and that we will and are doing all that we can within our powers uh, to support those who have uh, come from the, the, the rest of the, the EU and, and made Scotland home. Up to this point, the latest figures that we have, um, over uh, 170,000 EU citizens in Scotland have gone through the EU settlement scheme. Now, of course, I should re-emphasise that we in the Scottish Government don't agree with the, the way that the EU settlement scheme has been constructed by the UK Government. The fact that it's an application-based process rather than uh, a declarative process uh, has been the wrong-headed approach from the beginning, in our view, uh, both in terms of practical uh, considerations, but more importantly, because it's asking people to apply for rights that they've had for a long time, and we think that's wrong. So we will continue to push the UK government on that point, and that we believe that a conceptual change uh, is, is, would be of, of, of much benefit for a, for a whole range of reasons. Um, but we also have to work within the, the constitutional arrangements that we've got to support EU citizens through that process as, as long as the, the UK government uh, does keep this, the, the EU settlement scheme as, a, as an application-based uh, system. So we're, we want people to apply because even though we don't think they should have to apply, we want people to stay. Uh, so we've thought very, very carefully and sensitively uh, but also very purposely and passionately about keeping people here uh, and making sure they feel supported about how we, we support EU citizens in our communities here in Scotland through that scheme. And of course that has come together around the Scottish Government Stay in Scotland campaign, which was launched over a year ago now. And as part of that campaign, uh, working with uh, stakeholders and others like the, the European Parliament, we have produced a range of materials, supportive materials, including uh, information sheets and, 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 and uh, pieces of, of uh, paraphernalia, but also uh, toolkits for EU citizens to, to help them through the, the settlement scheme process. And also crucially employers uh, and others who, who will have uh, EU citizens uh, either as employees or volunteers or, or uh, tenants. To, uh, to in order to, to help employers take people through that process. Importantly, of course, we've not just uh, created these materials, but we've invested public money and public resource, uh, over one million pounds to support EU citizens and their families with these initiatives. And the, the most substantial uh, investment that we've made is part funding Citizens Advice Scotland to deliver an advice and support service. And the reason I emphasize that word advice is because the, the Home Office have an information service, but there's no way that you can get advice on your application through the UK government scheme. So we decided that that, that was inadequate uh, and, and decided to, to invest over and above anything the UK government are doing 
and provide uh, advice to, to EU citizens who need it. And that's delivered, as I said, through Citizens Advice Scotland, through their Citizens Advice Bureaus. And while they might be temporarily closed to face-to-face -face advice at the moment, uh, they continue to operate a national helpline as well as a range of online facilities. Uh, and that helpline number is 0800 916 9847. That's 0800 916 9847. Uh, I really want people to use that helpline. It has been used to this point uh, to, to quite a large extent, but we, we want, we are investing in that resource because we think it's important and we want people to use it to get the help and support that they need. And we're also funding uh, citizens' rights, uh, the Citizens' Rights Project uh, to uh, the EU Citizens' Rights Project to raise awareness of the EU Settlement Scheme, and we've done that since Brexit date. Uh, so we're collaborating with them as well as Citizens Advice Scotland, and they're doing uh, have done a range of events all over Scotland. But what they're doing at the moment is a range of different online events, and I would encourage people to use them and tune in just like they are uh, today. Importantly, uh, we are, are, are doing more in, uh, in the coming weeks to give even more support. Uh, and this is something that's been uh, worked up over the last few months. There was uh, fellow speakers raised the point about risk of discrimination. And we in the Scottish government were very conscious of the possibility of that and keen to do what we could to uh, make sure that we're engaging with as many people as possible to avoid any discrimination by, by uh, inadvertently uh, not knowing the rights that people have. And also to make sure that EU citizens here in Scotland are fully aware of the rights that they have so that they can uh, use the, the, the various uh, mechanisms and uh, facilities in order to, to uphold their rights as well if those rights are ever questioned or compromised. So we uh, engage with an organisation called Just Right Scotland, and they have now created a suite of materials that we are launching next week, uh, or the, in the coming weeks, which uh, set out the rights of EU citizens to vote, to work, to access healthcare, uh, education, housing, uh, basic financial services, and uh, welfare and benefits here in Scotland. And these fact sheets will be available, uh, not just in English, but also in Polish, Romanian, Lithuanian, Spanish, and Italian in the first instance. So we hope these resources will be helpful for EU citizens to understand their rights and know where to access further support if they need it, but also to make sure that all uh, stakeholders, whether that's housing providers or employers, uh, understand fully what EU citizens' uh, rights are and, and make sure that they're upheld. Now, uh, Per made a really important point at the beginning uh, of this whole event about how the current crisis of uh, the COVID-19 virus has emphasised the contribution of, of key workers. And you know, we've, we've always known this, that uh, those who, who, who work in, in roles which uh, some governments, not our government, uh, would describe as, as lower skilled are actually some of the most important skilled and contributors in our society. And we uh, have to recognize as well that uh, a lot of those key workers, whether that's in the healthcare sector, social care, in the agricultural sector, in uh, a number of other really key industries that there have been at the moment, say for example, in, in, in elements of manufacturing. Uh, since I've been migration minister, I've been so enlightened to an even greater extent, because I knew this from my other jobs in the past and just from my own personal experience, but the sheer contribution that EU citizens make, not just in the numbers in terms of the economic figures, but in the, 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 the contribution to public services, the, the sheer extent in which they contribute to the economy, uh, but also, as I mentioned at the beginning, importantly, the enrichment of our society and our collective culture together uh, is and always has been remarkable and has been brought to the fore uh, in, in an even more, uh, in an even starker way uh, in, in, in the circumstances of the coronavirus. And that must demand, uh, in my view, a reconsideration from the UK government. Uh, the, the, the arguments were there already before this crisis that the, the, the UK government's approach to immigration uh, was wrong-headed. Uh, out of this crisis, it is undeniably clear that what was proposed in 
February by the UK government in terms of the system they wish to implement after Brexit, but also the way that they've approached Brexit and some of the the, the really um, shameful rhetoric around EU citizens in, in previous months and years. Uh, the, we really have to put that behind us and, and, and acknowledge the reality uh, of the, the, they need to acknowledge the, the reality of the, the huge contribution that EU citizens make. Uh, and that's about uh, getting away from this rhetoric around higher skilled and lower skilled and instead valuing all skills and the Scottish government values all skills. Uh, and I've written to the Home Secretary uh, encouraging her to do this, to take a completely new approach uh, and to really consider the reality and the circumstances that we're in and, and have a, a really different approach to, to how she uh, takes forward both valuing EU citizens' rights but also uh, migration policy thereafter. And of course, crucially to that is the, the, the points that have been made earlier around how we need to extend the Brexit transition period because uh, we in the Scottish Government have called for it to be extended uh, by two years because uh, that not only has effect on the negotiations around the future relationship, but it also has a, a, a profound effect around the EU settlement scheme and that the deadline for that is June next year. So the end of June next year uh, is, 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 is when the scheme is, is uh, currently um, meant to end. And, and, and I think that with all the other issues that are going on, uh, while we uh, want people to secure their rights, people have, have, have got other things to do. Uh, UK, the, the, the UK government is, is constrained in its time. So we need uh, an extension, not only for the practical points around the economy and the, the Brexit process, but also the, the knock-on effect that that will have of extending the deadline on the EU settlement scheme and extending the deadline on the implementation of the UK government's new immigration system, because... Uh, the, the situation as things stand is that the UK government envisages a new immigration system coming into force in January 2021. And that would mean that businesses and the whole of society would have to get ready for that uh, immigration system being in place in, in the current circumstances where everyone's attention, including governments, uh, is quite rightly on, on the coronavirus uh, in, 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 uh, in principle, first and foremost. So. Uh, lots of challenges. In that, uh, just briefly, because I'm keen to get onto the questions, in that uh, letter to the Home Secretary, I also uh, argued, as has been said by, by other panel speakers, that the, the settlement scheme should have physical proof of status. This is something that we've argued for since the beginning, along with three million. Uh, the, 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 the arguments against having physical proof for those who, who want physical proof are, are very weak. Uh, we've seen in uh, the Windrush scheme that people can get physical proof when they go through that. So I don't, I, I don't think there's any legitimate basis for the UK government arguing uh, that EU citizens shouldn't have uh, physical status if, if, they, if, they, uh, if they want it. So we will keep pushing on that as well as an extension. And the, the, we have also argued, in, uh, just for, for wider awareness, because I think it's important that the UK government lift the no recourse for public funds restrictions and remove the habitual residency test, as well as pushing back on them around the health surcharge, um, because all of these factors would uh, are, are wrong in the here and now, but also would have an effect on EU citizens after uh, the end of the transition period. So uh, there's a lot more I could say, but I, I want to get onto the questions, and I, I think uh, it's important that that we do that. I'm looking forward to, to listening and contributing and hear what others have to say, but I would just emphasize at the beginning that, uh, in conclusion here at the beginning of our, our, our wider discussion, that you know, we in the Scottish Government fully appreciate the anxiety and uncertainty that EU citizens in Scotland and the whole of the UK have faced since the referendum. Uh, we think this should be brought to an end. Uh, we continue to argue uh, ways that that can be done, uh, but while uh, we are in the situation where the UK Government is proceeding, uh, on, on the timeframes that, that they say they are and with the, the EU settlement scheme as they've designed it, then we will continue to do all we can to support EU citizens here in Scotland, to help them to stay in Scotland uh, because uh, they're part of us. Uh, we, we're, we're together in this. Uh, it's our shared home. Um, the, the welcome here is, is strong and we need to do everything uh, collectively to help EU citizens uh, here in Scotland to, to stay uh, because that is they are part of Scotland and the Scotland we believe in is a, is a European one, an internationalist one and one that welcomes people from 
elsewhere in the world uh, to make your home. So thank you for having me as part of today's conversation. I really look forward to, to the questions and further engagement. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ben. That, that's excellent. Um, I think we've had two, two ex excellent introductions and, and talks from Terry and, and from Ben. And, and I, I take a lot from what you've both said. Some of it is very, very encouraging in a way in, in what, is, what is not for, I think, any, any of us on this panel, uh, you know, the desired outcome. And, and situation, uh, and, and it makes me certainly very, very aware of, of both the complexity of what is going on and the fact there, are, there is still a lot to, to fight for and to insist on and to protect, both in this process of people getting settled or pre-settled status, but in, as you say, in the physical proof, um, in how that then develops over time. There, there are bound to be issues that, that come up over time, and I, I think what, what people watching and listening can maybe take from this is, is to see both Scottish and European politicians very alert to this and, and very active on this. So we've had a few questions already and I will start putting those to our speakers. Um, I encourage you both to use the Q&A function if, you, if you're joining this through, through Zoom and if you're following this on Facebook, we're doing our best to monitor the comment. Um, part of, of the Facebook page. And so if you want to try and put a question on that, we will uh, try and pick it up and it will get, get sent through to me. Um, so I'm gonna start with quite a, a broad question that has come from John Francis. Um, I, I think this is a question of, about overall future migration policy. And what he says is, what is, you might have all day for this, what is the preferred mechanism, process and timetable to achieve full reciprocity in both directions for EU and UK citizens after the end of this year? I, th I think that's quite a big question, but I think it also links, Ben, to, to some of what you were just saying at, at the end there. Um, ben, do you want to maybe go first and then I'll come to you, Terry? Well, I, I, I guess that's a hard question for me to answer because the the, the, the degree to which we have reciprocity will will, will uh, be determined by what future relationship there may be and, 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 and how the UK government uh, wishes to establish that with the EU27. But from a Scottish perspective, and of course we're, we've argued for some time now that Scotland uh, is, is held back by the homogenous nature of the UK immigration system, we uh, have, and we published a paper in January, uh, just before Brexit on this, a very practical, sensible, informed paper about what solutions were available and, 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 and what could be achieved. Um, we believe that uh, short of independence with, within the UK framework, there are a number of different ways that the UK government could uh, change immigration policy in, Scotland, in, in the UK to be more like Canada or Australia, for example, where it gives different parts of the country the ability to set immigration policy in a different way. And because we have the institution of the Scottish Parliament and the infrastructure of the Scottish Government and an income tax code because income tax is devolved, and we already have public service checks we uh, think it's very practical, uh, practical uh, to have a system where the Scottish Parliament could set the rules and criteria for a Scottish visa that was an additional route into the UK, so an additional way to come in, but we'd, you would have to settle and work in Scotland, uh, that would allow us to set that rules and criteria uh, in order to continue to bring people uh, to, to live and work in Scotland. Uh, and that would be a practical way in which um, short of independence and uh, membership of the, the European Union uh, in its own right, Scotland could come to uh, an arrangement where it could continue to bring EU citizens here um, because of course we, we want people to come here uh, because it's, it's, it has a wider enrichment, but also uh, in Scotland, we want to fill that, that uh, demand in the economy um, that, that exists and obviously we've got to come out of the, 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 the position of, of the coronavirus has put the economy in, but the growth potential in Scotland will require 
more people and more skills um, and a range of skills. And uh, we, could, we could do that through the, the, the criteria of a Scottish visa. But also we have real uh, demographic issues in Scotland in that uh, our working age population uh, has grown by 1%, uh, but uh, all of that has been down to migration. And so we need to continue to bring people here in, in order to satisfy uh, the, the needs of, of our society as a whole. Uh, and I think a Scottish visa could help us enable to could help enable Scotland in order to continue to be able to bring people from the, the EU and elsewhere to. I know that right. wasn't a direct answer to the no, question. No, no, I, I think it is a very big context, question. So you took a big chunk of it. I think that was great. Thank you. And and Terry, what what what's you did already mention reciprocity, of course, in your opening remarks. Can I just first um, completely second what Ben was saying on the situation with the anti-immigration rhetoric that we have seen in the UK? And I must say, it's not only something that is uh, at the moment um, happening in the UK. Um, we also have very, very similar um, arguments in Germany. And I think that this anti-immigration uh, rhetoric in itself is a big problem um, because, um, as Ben said, I mean, we, we live in aging societies and we will need migration. Um, and this is just something um, that I think needs to be in a, in a broader discussion of why Brexit happened, why there was such divisive language, how also fears of people were being fueled very strategically and systematically, not showing all the positive sides that migration brings to our societies. I think that th this is something that we will have to address in a broader political debate, not only in the UK, um, but all over the European Union, because I think that this discussion is really um, poisoning our societies um, and you know migrants are being used as scapegoats whenever there is a problem um, um, and through that um, I think um, well, a lot of problems arise uh, and, and, and this has to be addressed on a broader level. If I can say what kind of migration um, a model or regime uh, I, I would like to see, I actually think that the single market with, with its uh, for freedoms including freedom of movement is a pretty good uh, a regime to have um, so if, if I was to choose I would just keep it that way you know that people can move freely obviously I know that this is not uh, what the UK government once, even though the Scottish uh, government has shown a very, a very different position here. I think the minimum, and this is also what we are going to say in the report, is that we want to have short-term um, stays without visa um, and to specifically look at um, uh, groups like, for example, students, researchers, um, specific groups of workers um, for, for exchanges uh, and to keep that open as much as possible. I can only tell you, and obviously these, these meetings happen in camera, um, but when we speak to the task force of the European Commission regarding how the negotiations are going there, um, it seems that the UK government is very, very difficult, very ideological, and does not even want to um, safeguard um, reciprocity in this field. And obviously, if you are confronted with this, it is a very, very difficult negotiation position that currently um, the European Union is in. Um, I would like to have as much possibilities for people to move uh, in the future, the absolute minimum uh, I have outlined. Um, I hope that we can fight together in the UK, but also in the rest of Europe against this anti-immigration rhetoric. Um, and with this, um, I hope then we can change what is currently happening, ba happening basically taking away rights from people to move uh, and get into a moment again where we can extend people's right to move. But Terry, do you, do you think this can, whatever degree of mobility we, we get to with, with the UK government, can this actually be done by the end of the year? I mean, you've just explained how difficult the talks are. Well, if I'm being absolutely honest, Kirsty, I don't think um, that uh, the agreement that we would like to see can be done in 11, could have been done in 11 months anyway with this situation right now where obviously negotiations are much more difficult and i'm not only talking about the negotiation teams when they come together but also the political oversight i mean mm -hmm. um, it's it's not that you know in the back room of wherever or in a zoom meeting or you know negotiators meet and they negotiate there has to be democratic oversight there needs to be debates with citizens in parliaments and so on and so on um, this is not happening to the same extent right now. And this is why I can only say again, um, if we want to come to a sustainable agreement in the field of citizens' rights, in the field of um, trade, uh, in, 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 in other areas, um, we, would, we would really need to have an extension of the transition mm -hmm. period. 
And I, and I have, this is for, for, for both of you, I have my own views on this, but Maura Williamson has asked, uh, there was a suggestion, I think, former Labour First Minister Henry McLeish made it, that, that Scotland could ask for a Scotland-only extension to transition. But I, I think uh, this may be a little bit tricky. Ben, do you have a view on that? Um, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Mike Russell, did speak to this, uh, I believe, in the Parliament on Tuesday, um, and uh, it, 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 it practically it's it's not. I don't want to say impossible, but I, I think it's it, 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 it's certainly difficult to achieve. Thank you, um, Terry. Do you agree with that? And also, I had from Christopher Kenmore a specific question for you. He he was asking. Um, obviously, you you. you talked about where we are in, in EU citizens' rights, but what is your on the European Parliament's overall view of the of the UK's settlement scheme and, and do you actually encourage people to to apply to this as the Scottish Government has been in, in the way Ben described in some detail? Well obviously I would say that if I was to uh, come up with a scheme um, for EU citizens living in the UK it would look different um, but indeed as we are in the situation that we are I would encourage people um, to, to apply for this scheme um, to have uh, at least more safety even if it's not the full legal safety or legal clarity that people um, would like to have in all cases. I mean, I've already said that the concern that is continuously brought to us is that people would really like to see physical documents. We already now have, there is a very interesting study that was commissioned by the 3 million actually. We already now have um, cases of discrimination where, for example, landlords ask for um, whether people have a settled status, a pre-settled status um, when, when they're applying for, for apartments. Um, so I would have designed it differently, but I think as we are in the situation that we are, uh, I would encourage people to apply for it and um, also to, uh, as Ben was saying, to get advice and information about their specific situation um, because there might be a lot, a lot of follow-up questions um, coming up for your specific situation. Um, so so I, would, I would encourage that. And I can only say that obviously we are pushing the UK government to make this as inclusive uh, as possible, but also we are working uh, on the uh, EU27 because in some of the member states, um, the, the dealing with this regarding UK citizens has also not been ideal. Um, so I think there is still a lot of uh, work to do there and the friendship group is on it. The first event that we actually organized uh, was on the question of citizens' rights. Um, so if you have specific political questions, not about your maybe individual situation, but political questions regarding that, also feel free to contact uh, us as the friendship group. And we also did have a question about um, how can people find out more about that um, friendship group? Is, is it on the Parliament website somewhere? Um, I think, I, I believe the question was about the, the Friends of Scotland group specifically, yes. um, which um, uh, we have kicked off, as Ben was saying, we met uh, in Brussels in, in January, um, just, be, just before Brexit was happening. Um, there, uh, we don't have a, a full running uh, website yet, but the, the um, Scotland representation in Brussels is doing a lot of work there. So um, if you want information, um, I'm sure you can contact them. Um, the EU UK Friendship Group has a website already where you can also find out about our activities. Um, as I said, we work very, very closely with each other. Um, we want to highlight the specific situation in Scotland um, as much as we can because indeed things are a little bit different in Scotland than in other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, and just maybe uh, to mention um, two other things, um, I have already spoken about the citizens' rights event that we did. Um, we are also envisioning to have uh, an event in London, uh, potentially if it's going to be possible, um, already in September, which I, I'm not sure it's going to happen. And then hopefully also to do something in Edinburgh and Scotland um, at some point um, where we want to network, um, bring MEPs so that you can also get to know as citizens, MEPs that are working in this friendship group uh, to network with uh, MPs from the UK, with MSPs from, from the Scottish Parliament, obviously people from the Scottish government um, to, to strengthen these ties. 
And then lastly, if you want to be um, um, updated about what we are doing, there is a newsletter that we send out um, where you can always get uh, the newest information about events that we are doing or maybe political positionings uh, that we are doing. Um, uh, as I said, uh, we are a very diverse group. There are a lot of different issues that um, we are going to work on. Um, and I think this might be interesting for you to follow if you are interested in, in what we are doing. Great, that, that's really helpful. Um, ben, maybe this next question is more for you, but I put it to, to both of you, uh, from Helen Ross, who asks, what's the future for the higher education sector research and Erasmus Plus in Scotland without EU citizens? The EU citizens specifically? Um, well, I think one of the, one of the well, first of all, I should say that the Scottish government is absolutely committed to the Erasmus programme. We think it's a remarkable programme that has had huge benefits for so many Scots and so many others uh, over, over several years. And in all my time as Minister for Europe in my previous role, every meeting I had with the UK government, I would re-emphasise Scotland's wish to continue to participate in uh, all the EU programmes, but particularly uh, Erasmus and uh, the Horizon program as well. Uh, the, the UK government has still uh, not fully signaled its intention on, on Erasmus. Um, the Scottish government's ambition would be to continue to participate in Erasmus. And as has been said, we continue to explore how Scotland would participate in Erasmus, even if the rest of the UK was, was not able to, or decided not to rather. Um, uh, so, I, I, I hope the, the, the question of, well, forgive me, but I think it's, it's about uh, the, the future of, of, of higher education. I think um, all of our, our collective experience will, will, will be diminished without that enrichment of people coming and learning and, and traveling and learning together. Uh, but um, I think that, that will have just as much of a it will be just as much of a, a loss to to the individuals as well as uh, uh, the institutions. Um, so we continue to explore how we can uh, continue Scotland's participation in Erasmus, and and and, and uh, a lot of that uh, consideration is is dependent on still waiting to see what the UK does, um, and uh, their. A shared Prosperity Fund, which was the uh, was and is the the, the construction, the, the vehicle um, that the UK government was proposing uh, financially to to uh, substitute. Although, um, in, in in my view, it will be hard to make it an equal substitute. Um, the, the the funding and the the, the benefits that these EU programs bring. Um, Unfortunately, uh, assurance and detail on the Shared Prosperity Fund has not been forthcoming. Um, but we continue to press on both of those points and explore what Scotland could do. And, and please excuse me, in terms of the last answer, uh, I haven't actually read the piece by uh, Henry MacLeish, so I can't speak on it in, in, in detail. But I think from memory, uh, my understanding is that the, the challenge is just like it is for uh, a number of areas uh, where we consider what Scotland can do uh, uh, could do uh, on its own, uh, and also the same issue that we faced when we put forward Scotland's place in Europe is that practical suggestions that we put forward do, uh, under the current constitutional arrangements, require uh, some constructive involvement and good faith from the UK government because the UK government is, of course, uh, the negotiating partner when it comes to Brexit. Uh, under the, the international legal arrangements. So uh, the UK government would have to consent uh, to uh, an extension in Scotland uh, under my understanding, although, like I said, I haven't read the piece by Mr McLeish, so I don't want to um, comment er erroneously on that, sure. but it would be my understanding. Thank you. Terry, did you want to come in on this? Rasmus yes, Plus and just just one one brief point um it was very interesting that uh, after the brexit referendum happened and um, the university of edinburgh actually organized an event in brussels um where um they said very clearly that um to them 
the outcome of this referendum um, was obviously very negative because there are a lot of uh, EU citizens uh, working in the university because they're really profiting from the different research and, and um, study programs that the European Union is offering. Um, and I think in that sense, I mean, absolutely following up on, on what Ben was saying, um, this is for us as a friendship group and for me also personally, because I had this experience uh, in, in, in the UK and Scotland, um, to keep the UK uh, in the, the programs um, because it would have a very, very negative effect for both the UK, the UK and the European Union to, to not have the UK anymore. But, and I would like to add that, um, because I think there was also a question about the, the UK's position on this, um, we have not yet heard green light that there would be willingness because obviously a continued um, membership or um, um, staying inside of the program would also mean a financial contribution. Um, what I think is important, and this is why I was mentioning uh, the University of Edinburgh, is that now with this situation, we see a lot of well, active advocacy, first of all, but then also um, universities, um, you know, different associations, different parts of society um, to take initiatives um, to build even stronger ties with their counterparts uh, in the European Union and respectively from the European Union to the UK because I cannot at the moment see that it's um, absolutely safe that the UK is going to stay in the Erasmus program and other research programs. And I think then it will be even more important that the universities, that the different research institutions, that different institutions in society um, have a stronger engagement with each other because we will need that if we uh, in the future still want to have uh, close ties and, and strong exchanges. Um, and this is why I would say we need to put the political pressure now, but we also need to look at um, what can institutions like, for example, universities and others do in order to build strong ties in the future. Okay, um, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in. I'm gonna try and sort of combine one or two of the questions where, where they're on um, a similar area. But there, there's a couple around, coming back then to the powers of the Scottish government on on migration or the lack of powers of the Scottish government. Um, so, so Louise has asked to what extent could the Scottish government diverge from a points-based immigration system? And Neves has asked what happens in a no deal Brexit scenario? To what extent could Scotland in a no deal Brexit have any powers to make their own rules around migration in that situation? Um, the first question, the, the paper that I talked about um, that we launched in January, which was called um, Migration Helping Scotland Prosper, uh, very purposefully after a lot of engagement with business and other organisations, set out a range of possibilities to the UK government um, in a very open way saying, here's different things that you could do, uh, Home Secretary, within the UK framework that would enable Scotland to have a tailored and appropriate migration system uh, that would better suit Scotland's needs than what the UK government was proposing and still is proposing, uh, unfortunately. Um, so the move to a points-based system that the, the UK government uh, envisages undertaking for implementation in January 2021, uh, caveating that by the points I made at the beginning that the the, the, the effort from government that that will take and the input from business and stakeholders that that will take to, to have that in place by January 2021 is, is extremely demanding. Uh, and I think there is a real question whether it's deliverable, uh, to, to, to put it mildly. Um, but at some point, the UK government's vision is to bring in a points-based system. And there, whether it's devolution of some powers to the Scottish Parliament so that we could, um, with, with listening to, after listening to stakeholders cr create the, 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 the criteria uh, uh, and rules for a Scottish visa, um, or whether it was uh, not, not such a, a, an empowering way of, of giving Scotland more powers, but by delivering flexibility, but instead by delivering flexibility through the UK system, uh, there are ways that the UK government could could uh, differentiate immigration policy for Scotland quite easily and practically. Um, 
and the points-based system lends itself to that uh, if the UK government was was minded to and that they could give uh, people more points for coming to Scotland for example. Um, so there are lots of opportunities and, and possibilities that the UK government could do uh, constructively and in good faith. We just need them to uh, approach what we're seeing in Scotland. And remember, it's not just the Scottish government that's arguing for more powers over uh, or flexibility or a different approach, tailored solutions uh, for, for Scotland when it comes to immigration. It's you know, a range of business organisations, a range of other providers and, and public service uh, organisations who are saying, you know, we need practical solutions here. Uh, we just need the UK government to, to come to the table and uh, be, be reasonable about this and uh, it, we, some solutions could undoubtedly be found. Um, Harry, this might sound quite familiar to you from, from your view of the EU-UK and the, now what we see within the UK, and it's certainly something I've picked up looking at this as a researcher, is the, the discussion across the four devolved areas of the UK is, is, is not, not happening as it should and as, as you would like, as one would like it to. Um, well, I can only say that the European Union has always shown um, a lot of openness um, to also, um, well, have discussions with uh, not only the, the Scottish government, but also um, the Welsh government um, and obviously um, also addressing the specific situation in Northern Ireland. Um, but it's a little bit um, like my colleague Alan Smith uh, used to say in the European Parliament, um, you kind of have to work with uh, what is coming from, from the UK side. So. Um, I think that um, the, the openness is there to, to come to um, also maybe a little bit creative solutions uh, in a lot of different fields. But if there is absolutely no readiness from the UK government, I can tell you that it's just going to be very, very difficult. Um, and I think we have to be realistic in that sense. Um, and I mean, this applies obviously to a lot of different policy fields where um, the Scottish government has over the past years always shown a more constructive approach, um, has given very insightful, interesting um, uh, proposals, how to deal with certain situations. Um, the discussion in the European Parliament has always been very sympathetic towards that, I believe also in the European Commission. But as said, uh, if the UK government is blocking having this kind of engagement and um, pushing through um, very, I would call them hardline positions on a lot of different issues, um, then it's going to be difficult. And maybe to come to, to the question of no deal. Um, I have fought against Brexit uh, in the referendum. Uh, after the referendum, I have tried to engage as much as possible so that we reach a sensible deal, but also supporting the call for a final say in the UK. Uh, I'm giving up hope in the moment when really things uh, are done and nothing is to be done anymore. So I'm still obviously um, trying to, um, to fight for having an extension and then having a negotiation that actually leads to a sustainable and comprehensive deal. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we just have to acknowledge the fact um, that right now it is looking very, very bad. Uh, very little progress has been made and uh, the UK government is insisting on that they're not going to ask for an extension. And then I simply don't see what we can do other than also being prepared uh, for a no deal situation. Um, it's very sad for me to say that, um, but I think we have to start looking at what will come after that um, and how um, uh, how to deal with that both on the UK side as well as the European Union side. Yes, thank you. We have, um, not surprisingly, since this is a discussion about Scotland, uh, we have a more political question from David Gow who asks, can we look forward to offering EU's 27 citizens citizenship in an independent Scotland in the European Union or is that an utter pipe dream? So, Ben, uh, I, I guess you might tell us it's not a pipe dream. <laughs> Certainly not in, in, in my view or my heart. No, definitely not. I think that uh, Scotland's uh, journey to independence is, is unstoppable. I think it's, it's uh, becoming the, the settled will uh, consciously um, of uh, the Scottish people, uh, largely uh, in, in recent years, uh, people changing their mind because of Brexit. Uh, and also um, younger generations seeing uh, both the, the fact that uh, devolution has delivered many benefits and uh, seeing that the, the, the continued evolution of the Scottish Parliament into becoming 
uh, a fully sovereign parliament and being able to to undertake the the wishes of the Scottish people across the board um, is, is more and more appealing and uh, I think consistently Scotland's commitment to the European Union as a place where independent countries come together around shared aspirations and values and challenges uh, has been underlined uh, time and time again in recent years from not just the referendum in 2016 but the support that there's been at the ballot box since then for pro-EU parties in Scotland and also, of course, the strong vote for pro-EU parties uh, in the European election. So uh, I'm optimistic. I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a, an exciting prospect. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot to work through uh, to get there, um, but uh, it's, it, will, it would be the most beneficial uh, situation for Scotland, uh, for our, our society and our economy, and uh, the environment and, and other issues that we, we, we hold so, so close and are so important. Uh, but also I think it'd be a huge benefit to the EU, not just for the people who will be able to, to come here uh, and, and get those passports that you talked about uh, if they wish to, um, but also because of what we bring, you know, that uh, intellectual uh, capacity, those natural resources, uh, and importantly, uh, that sense of partnership and a determination for Europe as uh, a beacon of democracy and human rights to continue to, to play a, a collaborative together, uh, collaboratively together to play an active role in, in making the wider world a better place. Great. And, and Terry, do you want to make any comments on that? I mean, if Scotland were legally and constitutionally independent is the way we usually put this question to outsiders, could it join the EU? Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, I won't comment on, on the question of independence. Uh, I think that's really a decision to be made for the people in Scotland. But um, as you probably know, I mean, I initiated a letter, um, now it's already almost um, three years ago, um, with 50 colleagues from all over uh, the European Union, um, from different parliaments, from regional parliaments, from local parliaments, but also from a lot of national parliaments, also colleagues from the European Parliament across the political spectrum, saying that um, if Scotland were to become independent, obviously we are leaving a light on um, and you would be um, very, very welcome um, back in the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a message that just needs to be repeated over and over again because mm -hmm. this is not over. And if I can, to make a little bit of a, of a broader comment on this, I mean, now we are in this situation, we're in this negotiation, we're looking at extension, we're looking at the problems that had, um, I'm 33 now, the last speech I gave on Brexit in the European Parliament was that um, in my lifetime, I'm still going to see British MEPs being re-elected to the European Parliament. And it's something that I truly believe, you know, I'm not in it for just the next two, three years. Um, obviously, that's the political cycle that a lot of politicians look at, and it's important. Um, but if you look at the next 10, 15 years, I think a lot of things can happen. I think Brexit is going to have a very, very negative effect on Scotland, but also on the rest uh, of the UK. I think debates can change. Um, and this is why the struggle continues. And I believe um, that Scotland and the rest of the UK is part of Europe and as such um, should um, also continue to, to look at how strong alliances can be built. Um, and then we will see what's going to happen in, in, in mm -hmm. 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think, thank you. I think those both both very helpful answers. And, and, and indeed, I'm aware of people across across the UK who, who aren't giving up on on the whole UK or whether it's what, uh, the whole UK or more, two or more independent countries in 10 years or 20 years, um, nonetheless, coming back to the European Union. We, we've got five or six minutes, I think, or maybe as much as 10 left. Um, I've got some rather more specific um, comments and questions from, from different people. So I, I wanted to bring three together and, and maybe between you, you can see which ones you want to, to answer and between you answer all of them. Um, there's one question about voting rights, um, which says Commonwealth citizens in the UK have voting rights, which EU citizens don't have. Um, is that just and could it be challenged in the courts? So, that, so there's a question about voting rights post-Brexit. Post um, there's someone uh, with a question from London saying they hope they're not crashing the party, absolutely not, you're very welcome, um, who says they haven't applied for settled status because of the data protection issue, um, that they consider that hugely underreported and not, not discussed enough. 
Um, is the EU aware of this issue and is anything being done about that? Um, and then the third point is about the role of the Department of Work and Pensions um, and that uh, the, the questioner here says the settled status isn't recognized by the DWP. Um, applying for the universal credit was unbelievably stressful after complications getting settled status granted. Um, what is the point of the settled status then? Um, so there are a lot of frustration there, but um, I'm not an expert on this, but I'd understood there were differences between settled and pre-settled status on, on that. And I, I don't know if um, between you, you can clarify some of that. So, so Ben, do you want to go first on picking up? Maybe that last one, perhaps touch briefly on the first one, if that's okay. Um, I mean, on, on the last one, uh, I'm aware of, as you would expect, the, the issues that a number of, uh, quite, quite too many people have had when it comes to trying to claim universal credit um, with uh, and, and its connection with the, the, the EU settlement scheme. And there's an issue I've, uh, we've raised with UK government and has been uh, pressed in the House of Commons uh, on several occasions recently. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear, uh, please forgive me, where matters stand right now because um, I'm uh, we're, we're awaiting response from the UK government on that point, um, but it certainly is concerning and it relates into that, that wider uh, set of points that I made in, in my opening remarks around the risk of discrimination uh, and, and how we need to make sure that uh, those with settled status uh, and pre-settled status are fully clear on their rights uh, and that providers, uh, both in the private and public sector, are clear on, on what EU citizens are entitled to, both now and um, after June 2021. Um, and we'd also, because of the differentiation between uh, settled and pre-settled, and, and you're right, the, 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 the people's entitlement uh, under the welfare state does differentiate between the two. Um, we think that's wrong. Uh, because we don't think there should be, uh, for, for a number of reasons, including because we don't think there should be a pre-settled status. Uh, we think everyone who applies for settled status should get full settled status with everything that comes with it. Uh, and we continue to emphasize that point to UK government, um, not just because of the practical points that, that are raised in part of that question, uh, but also uh, considerations around, uh, it mean, the fact that there's a pre-settled status means that people have to apply twice for this. Uh, so the bureaucratic, practical problems that it causes for UK government are completely unnecessary. Um, so we'll keep pushing along with uh, the three million uh, for there to just be settled status rather than pre-settled and that would deal with a lot of these issues. Um, with regard to the, 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 the first question, um, I don't have the legal expertise to, to comment on uh, the, the the, the, the prospects of a legal challenge, uh, but what I would say is I'm very proud that the Scottish Parliament has, of course, given uh, guaranteed full voting rights when it comes to, to elections in Scotland, both the Scottish Parliament and local government uh, to EU citizens uh, and others, actually, um, who've come to Scotland from elsewhere. Uh, and that's a, a really progressive development and the right thing to do, and I'm glad we've done it. Great. Um, Terry, some last comments on these points? Um, just very briefly, um, uh, following on what Ben has already uh, said, I'm not going to repeat everything. Um, just the data protection issues. Um, obviously, that this is this is also something that has been brought to us. Um, again, if there are specific, maybe additional points that haven't been addressed in the special committee that haven't been addressed by us as the friendship group in the European Parliament, feel free to share them with us. Maybe I can also share the. Um, uh, the address of our website so that uh, that you can get in touch with us. Um, I wanted to make one point about the, the question of voting rights and citizenship. I mean, there are now a lot of debates around citizenship, also uh, obviously in the European Union. I think, yes, challenging it in court, I mean, always good to, to find out whether this might be uh, possible to push for strategically. Um, but 
one of the things that we are also fighting for, because this will be a big topic in uh, the Future of Europe conference that we are going to hold um, in the upcoming months, uh, as you know, um, citizens' engagement on what do we want to, to change in the European Union, um, what might be uh, endeavors that, that citizens push for, proposals that also come from citizens. And I think this question of citizenship will be one of the very important topics discussed there. And this is why the Friendship Group is pushing for um, also having the possibility for UK citizens um, still contributing to this conference, despite the fact that the UK is not part of the European Union anymore. Also there you can uh, hopefully soon get uh, further information on our website. And then there will hopefully be pathways um, where your voices can be heard specifically also on the question of citizenship. Great, many thanks. And I, and I think it's, it's lovely to end on, on that sort of positive idea, the idea that, that you, you'll at least argue for UK citizens to, to have, have a voice in where, where the European Union goes next. Um, we're, we're out of time, so it just, uh, it just behoves me to thank all our participants, all, all of you watching on Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, special thanks from you all, uh, a round of applause, but you won't hear it, to Ben Burkperson and Terry Reintke. Um, huge thanks to Per Johansson and his, his very talented and professional team at the European Parliament office in Scotland. Um, I think I probably speak for many in Scotland when I say we're delighted that, that your office is still here in Edinburgh and a, a last bit of lobbying towards you, Terry. We very much hope it will stay open um, and that, that would be great if that might just happen. But, but thank you again, Ben, Terry, and thank you, Pear, and, and goodbye, everybody. And I hope that was both helpful as well as interesting and stimulating. Thank you. <laughs>